seven high-functioning loose levers. The scenery continued much as before. And then, the caravan found itself on a tapering finger of land, extending farther and farther into the increasingly clearer and clearer waters of the Great Delta Bayou. But they weren't clear forever. At the far end of the finger, where it tapered to the width of a single cart, a black mass was visible, with oily smoke arising occasionally. As soon as he saw Neozo, Barry was struck by deadly premonitions. This was a city of entropy, of decadent and twilight effulgent ruination. There was no doubt it was one of the world's few cities of a unique breed a city of destiny. The caravan came to a stop. They were at the gate. Barry prepared his puffing apparatus. This would be a major test. The gate rose high, crafted of tarnished brass with poorly done filigree. The walls were crumbling mossy masonry that looked like it would topple at a light shove. A viewing aperture opened, beady eyes peered out, it shut. Then from out of the guardhouse trundled two ultra-sagging buffoons with pointy helmets and garlic breath. Their breeches were sweating grease stains in real time. They sidled up to the head wagon. Barry stepped out, laying a level gaze on them. Hey boss, the saggiest of the duo said, customs. We just gotta inspect the cars. Won't take long. Barry made no response, watching with hawk-like gaze as they pulled themselves in. There was a clattering as if they intended to take it apart from the inside. Several complaints came from the boys. A lot more jostling. More clattering. When they slunk out, their arms were laden with bags of ingredients and all Barry's alchemical equipment. Weezy gotta confiscate these. Regulations restrict you from dash. Quick as lightning, Barry's arm shot out. With his patented mini fumigator held deftly between forefinger and middle finger, he used his thumb to operate the push pump that sent a squirt of purple vapor directly up the left nostril of each guard. It was almost too quick to spot with the naked eye. Immediately, the doofuses became unsteady on their feet. With nearly as much speed, Barry began grabbing the loot out of their hands and transferring it to Flunky, who transferred it into the wagon. Barry studied the effect the gas was having. Fascinating, he muttered. It had been a small dose. Even so, he had expected to see at least slightly more reason enter the subject's gaze. Instead, they appeared merely stupefied. He waved a hand to observe their emotion. Their reasoning capacity was uncompromised, but it seemed their ability to access it had been somehow short-circuited. The result was classic psychohypnotic flux in their current state, they should be completely open to suggestion. Hurry and open the gate, Barry said, then report back. The ultrasagger scampered into the guardhouse, and the gate swung inward. Then they came right back, saluting and standing at attention. Now, you need to do something about your filthy pants. You never met us, that's for sure. But you do have a great idea. That water dash Barry pointed to a shallow pool at the edge of the land, discolored from the effluvia of the city could be a great spot to test for cleaning properties. But if the water is going to really prove its worth, it has to be put to the test. So go sit in that water and cack and piddle to see if the water can handle it. When your superior or replacement comes, if they want you to move, you'll just tell them to stick it up their arse. The water will need to be tested until well after sundown at the least. You can't take a break or it doesn't work, everybody knows that. Well, you can't be detained any longer. Go to it. The men saluted rigidly, then took to their positions like sagasu or suck ducks. As the carts moved through the gates, loud shit and piss sounds could be heard behind. ATS the stuff. A good one. We gotta really find out if this puddle can handle it. Yeah. Better lay it on. The city was busy, the tight streets crowded. In the main wagon, there was handling of maps to determine the quickest route to a suitable inn that could stable the speed mules. The haunt of ravens lived up to its name, with plenty of crows and wrens thrown in. It also looked like lizards, rats and cockroaches were very much at home here, 
and despite teeming with visitors, Barry guessed the human part of the population must form a small fraction of the city's total. It would be a perfect stomping grounds for animist shamans who worked with pests pest walkers, a particularly noisome breed. He already knew that it was a world headquarters for the practice, due to alchemist contacts which he corresponded with the city was a small but significant location in the alchemical world due to its proximity to rare, often putrid ingredients. However, true alchemists didn't cluster together in trendy population hubs, nor concern themselves with hierarchy. For the alchemist, it was a matter of obtaining knowledge, and no ability was considered a part of the alchemic arsenal until it had been meticulously tested and peer-reviewed. Pest walkers knew no other life than gathering in hubs, following the latest fashions and bickering among themselves about what or who was in and what or who out, huddling around their common culture and repelling any outsiders they naturally took on a human version of the social habits of their spirit creatures. Without doubt, the veteran pest walker could call upon some potent powers. But along with having a very narrow focus, half the time, abilities that the individual practitioner believed were among their strongest, were all in their head, fabrications of their own imaginations and this was on the better end of the spectrum. The quantity of visitors made it seem certain that there were other, more accessible entrances to the city than the way they'd come. But they were far out on water, no doubt about it. Some streets had more puddle than pavement, and twice, a side street was passed which was totally submerged for a good length. Every structure, whether the humblest hovel or the most ornately filigreed grande inn, seemed as if it were about to collapse like a soggy cardboard box caving in on itself. There were loose and ultra-sagistrum pets, young and old, male and female, and of all tones and physiognomies, frequently multiple factors mixed together in the same harlot, loitering singly and in groups on every other street corner, most wearing little, many wearing nothing, and Barry could also see why it was called the city of deep stink. There were unscientific, unscrupulous chemical vendors and the horrors of addiction ghostly folk starving in the streets, beyond withdrawal, and in a world of torn instincts and dissected and desiccated. Hearts which none on the outside could hope to understand, nor the wise wish to. And there was the chump, waddling around with a drink around his neck like a dog, aimless and hopeless, a tourist in search of the expanding sag, his flesh flopping down in blooms of fatty waddle age, torpid muscle sacks jamming on the pull of gravity, layering and loosening and flapping and flopping and putting on the sedentary weight in search of that ultra state, the ultra sag. It was the ultrasag that put Neozo on the map. For the Sagia, this was paradise. The caravan pulled into the stable area of the Kumquat, and in recommended in Torval's notes as cheap and not too noisy. Scampering stable hands handled the storage, and Barry tipped each one. Then he turned to the group, now milling about with uncertain looks. Listen here. We'll split up and explore the town. Is everyone here? Flunky, take a head count. Meet back in this spot at sundown. Get your lunch, of course, but try to find out as much as you can about major wrestling venues in the area. All right, split. The puddles of Neozo. The waters. The effluvia. Purple puddles that trap the mediocre, the curious, the incurious. And swallowed them to a realm beneath, where potential went to rot. The miasmal aura of brown rotting stagnation flowed in morbid currents. And the ravens caught above, ready for what bones would be thrown up. The dark, shiny, oily puddles in reflection of colored lights. The porous, oily, ultra-sagging flesh. The crooked rat smiles of unhealthy teeth. And most portentous, the growling sneers of the lowest scum, making play at being arrogant and taking on an air of superiority. When those who know perfectly well that they're better than no one, make play at being better than everyone, it's a sign that they have nothing to lose and an explosive orgy of self-destruction is soon to follow. So the puddles will shortly have more bones for crows, be assured. Be assured. The puddles wept. And as their oily tears spread, further and further streets were submerged in stagnant water that mingled with the overflowing sewers. 
What a time to be a sewer rat! A dog face woman peered from behind a curtain. Several dog face boys in leather garter belts milled about, looking bored. It was a day that stank. A day that stank. A day that stank. He came to the little door. Knock, wait patiently. Knock again. The routine. The one contact that he knew in Neozo was a rate walking dandy, Marcel. It was just possible he had some hint as to the direction of M. Dr. Jayhawk, due to his constant interest in social goings on, and Jayhawk's high social standing. However, Barry had been led to believe, via the chatter of the grapevine, that he was barely competent even for a pest walker, and would be of no value to the quest if he hadn't heard anything. Barry could detect with a brief third eye scan that Marcel was pulling himself up off his sofa, trying to seem aloof and mysterious by taking a long time to answer the door, and that he thought his rat allies were masking his aura. This was a complete fabrication not only could Barry plainly see it, he could read Marcel like an open book at all times. He hoped the little pest walker was keeping active and not getting too bogged down in the claustrophobia of the fashionable world. He checked such thinking compassion was all very well, but Marcel was an adult. There would always be those who chose the minor pursuits it was the ecosystem of life. Marcel was more bedraggled when he answered the door, more, more bedraggled. He was so bedraggled. And Barry wondered for Marcel. Barry wanted to help Marcel, but what would that even mean? What would that even look like, help Marcel? There was Marcel, more bedraggled than he perhaps needed to be but, than he perhaps wanted to be? Who knew? And Barry knew that Marcel wasn't really a pest walker wasn't tied down by the scene. Marcel had learned some tricks. Barry introduced himself, since Marcel had never seen him. And Marcel nodded. Come in, there's Tease. He was cordial and pleasant to talk with, a fellow of occasional erudition. I was whiling the day away, before my night shift. Barry knew Marcel worked a night shift teaching Spanish. And he knew, from Marcel's correspondence, both personal and in publications, that it was at night school that he had met many rats. He learned some magical tricks with rats. It wasn't who he was. It was a waypoint on the journey of Marcel's life, a journey of wandering and romanticizing. Marcel's journey. But it had left Marcel cold. He was not thrilled by his romanticizing. He wasn't any more interested in social goings on than Barry. It's a way to pass the time, Marcel said, but people get wrapped up in it. I do think MJ Hawk was traveling, likely to many of the places you guys are headed. If it's about the Andirene strain, I hope you can find him. That'll be sick, when you can get that really going. Barry saw that Marcel meant it, and now he saw how truly different Marcel was from a normal pest walker. The jealousy on Marcel's face was open, totally unconcealed, nor was there an effort to inflate his own lifestyle. It was evident he had outgrown the pest scene. But what would he do now? He was listless. And he maintained the occult trappings, because he simply didn't know where else to go. What would become of Marcel? He had outgrown his little world, and he had nowhere else to go. Barry could only think of how much they had in common. But the difference was Barry had the trails Barry had the woods. Barry had nature, and for a gentle person, a scholar for a human being, there could be no greater gift. Alchemy conferred some benefits, it was true, which a worldly nature might hunger after. But for Barry it was always just another angle through which to admire nature. Nature could outgrow you, but you could never outgrow nature. What of Marcel? Did the rats give him any appreciation of nature? Barry doubted it. At one time it had seemed transgressive and new. Then, the stink of expectations and surroundings had crept in. Crabs in a bucket. Crabs in a bucket. Barry sipped his tea without relish. This city is sinking into the water, said Marcel. It will be underwater. Then what will happen to the rats? I need to find a good place where there are rats, 
but it isn't sinking. He sipped his tea. Marcel was looking out the window. And it seemed that he would float away. It seemed that he would float, float away. We are going across the country, and we won't be going past Neozo again. I appreciate the viewing of this fine city. Marcel said nothing. He looked at his tea, and he looked out the window. And it seemed that he would float away. The inn smelled. There was the buzz of jabber. Ultra flabby plebeians sat in front of slot machines on all sides. What were their dreams? There was a dog face harlot in a purple one piece with super pointy nipples blocking Barry's way. The dog boy says hi, she yelped. Then she melted into the background. The room was small, brown, not as dirty or smelly as most places in Neozo. Barry was unaccountably exhausted. The group had agreed that the place to go was the Chrome Dome Arena, where they could book something for the weekend, in three days. Expenses shouldn't be too taxed staying at the Kumquat. The men were enthusiastic enough. There were sights to see. And things to do. Nobody seemed too tempted by the gambling. Barry crossed his fingers. Addiction made for good actors. If too many succumbed for the group to continue, he was prepared to commandeer a speed mule and go it alone. Tomorrow evening, they would wrestle at a small venue. It had been arranged. A good chance to test the lower tiers of the group. Barry felt mildly nauseous from so many puddles. He lay down to sleep. In the darkness. Now, the hall was black as pitch. Black as pitch. The floor was wet. And there was dark clattering whenever he made a step. There was no light at the end. But he stepped. Soon the noises. At his footfalls. Came. More discordant. More drawn out. More grating. Barry felt his nerves writhe. Each step brought a long period of sound, during which it was impossible to move. And he looked up. Up and to the left. There were the eyes. Bright red and malevolent, cold and calculating. He closed his eyes. And lunged. Through a million miles of space. Through eternities. Through the same dark seas through which his memory of the mountain hike had traveled, but this time it was darker, and he was going sidewise, not up, with no sand or end in sight. He lunged. The quantities of emptiness created the sense of worlds by the sheer weight of their non-volume, the sheer volume of their non-weight. And then, the eyes. Fink ahoy. On a little red bug, spookily effulgent in the dark, like a stout praying mantis. Barry groaned. The praying mantises are almost always assholes. Whole hot arbory yo yo duo in hiriri. Why my good sir human, the little fellow exclaimed, that's for me to know, wait for Thuriot, and you, to not find out. Ha ha ha, delight, it effulged, throwing up a rain of magic pixie dust and twinkling into oblivion. Looked like this asshole wasn't bucking any trends. Think of Est. Good thing I'm capable, thought Barry. And he drifted back through a basal lion fathoms of night. And came to a place he feared. Above was a sky impossibly full of bright twinkling stars, shining with purpurate effulgence. Below, nothing but the old one-armed bandit not an actual bandit, that is, but rather rows and rows of slot machines, infinite on all sides. But these bandits would make off with your heart, and they only needed one arm to do it. But they could have more if they wanted to. They could have as many arms as they chose. Barry saw the slot machines. And he witnessed with horror. His boys had been seduced. They were pouring the entire budget into the bandits. The symbols and colors rolled and blinked, with clacking and dinging and much ado, and never did anyone score well. Not even once did any of the men manage to even break even. But so enticing and kinetic was the Fosdingy action of those many colored wonder slots, that it kept them putting and yanking with fanaticism. Then Barry noticed all his boys had dog faces. They were the same old T-Town crew, but their faces had been dogicized by some mystery program. 
and without warning, he noticed an alarming new item of newsworthy momentousness. It was multi-momentous. The boys were having sex with the slot machines. Now, remember their slot machines. And they were going after it, I mean every one of them, there was no shame when they were making passionate love and sex. Slot machines were having the love-making of their lives from T-Town Lonely Boys. And they had really nice slots. And that slot can be really useful when love needs to happen with optimum efficiency. Useful for love-making. T-Town Boys licked their circuits. But Barry was determined to be above this. He was a moral guy. Until he quickly betrayed that morality, maybe he shouldn't have even brought it up, he really set himself up on that one. To them, we are the dildos. Because he'd just seen a lovely slot machine that was oiled and functional. It wore a gauzy purple tank top and a chipper hairbun. He could see it was a sporty bandit, and he gave in right away. He was having sex with the unit and Marcel whispered into his ear, You do really good, I think it's nice how welly you have sex with that unit, in a breathy voice. Then he started to take pictures. And Barry knew that there would be no money left, and that he'd betrayed his values and was a dumb dumb nut. However, he was willing to have more sex with the slot machine. Because he couldn't think of anything else to do with his time. Oh baby. Oh sweet honey, oh mama mama. Who needs wrestling when highly functional devices fulfill your lonely needs all night long? Cold slots. Cold slots. Cold slots. Above, the purpurate stars twinkled malevolently. Eight of rat bastards and men. The T-Town boys marched in formation down the Neozo streets. It was drizzling into raining. The town was wet like a slug in the grey midday humidity haze. A crazed drunk flung. Insults at no one and everyone. A few intrepid shoppers selected rags and dirty looking files of seasonings. The puddles gathered strength. Turning a corner, they stopped for a briefest moment, looking down the street. There it was, just two blocks farther the massive chrome dome arena. As they walked up to it, Barry in the lead, trailed closely by Tobias and Flunky, and then all the rest in a big rabble, the market stalls thinned out. They came to an imposing gate. This was the main entrance. Down a massive concrete ramp, the crowds would swarm on opening night into the bowels of the complex. Now that it was closed, the dungeon darkness of below seemed perfectly suited to keeping crowds away. Above an enclave to the side was a sign that said bookings. Here, a man with lank black hair and a black mustache stood commanderly at a table covered with documents. What time can my group book for opening night? asked Barry. Not happening. We're skilled wrestlers. I've never heard of you. I haven't even told you where we're from. Where are you from? We're the T-Town boys, from the central regions. Absolutely out of the question. You have no reputation. Jazzy Jayhawk has wrestled people in this group. Where's Jazzy Jayhawk to back you up on that? This is the Chrome Dome Arena. We have strict standards to maintain. Our audience is used to seeing proven fighters and only proven fighters. Prove yourselves and consider coming back in a year or so. I know this is the wrong thing to say. But this is not the great arenas. Of course your venue is top of its class, but there's no way that fighters as tough as us wouldn't enhance your evening roster. Well you're right, that is the wrong thing to say. And you don't know anything about our evening roster. And I can assure you and anyone that asks that it's going to be an excellent evening roster with proven fighters. We are proven fighters. I've absolutely never heard of you. Barry walked a ways away from the booking area, motioned his boys to gather in a huddle. This guy is not budging. With the fight setup being this insular, I like our chances at distinguishing ourselves. They probably don't even get proper practice. And practice is the idea here. When we go in there, I don't want you guys to hesitate throwing yourselves at stronger, more experienced fighters. This is all about getting the practice in. 
You let me worry about how we're getting in. I've got a way. Now let's go back and get rested for the minor fight this evening. Break. The T-Town boys marched in formation down the Neozo evening streets. They came to the front of the pub, Raccoon Erie. Let's check out this action, said Tobias with gusto. It was a squat, dark facade lit sporadically by oily, sputtering light, with uproarious jazz sounds seeping out. On opening the creaking door, a blast of sound and stink snaked its way into the street. The light was scarcely better inside than out. In the center of a large dining floor covered with small circular tables, there stood a ratty old ring. Oily light emerged from small, cut-rate chandeliers dotting the low ceiling. In the great room's corners, captive chumps plugged away at one-armed bandits. Barry gulped. The challengers were greasy local boys. Flunky sent one after the other of the T-Town challengers into the ring. Few lost. These local boys were just desperate for drink money, it was clear. They were no fighters. The crowd rarely looked up from its meal. Finally, Tobias went out to fight the headliner a dog-faced ultra-flabby big man who had nothing going but wait. The crowd was drunker, noisier, and slightly more interested now that they were in what they obviously considered the right mind state to watch wrestling. The big man got an early grip on Tobias and applied his weight, giving him a run for his money. But Tobias was able, with expert balance, to strap out of the grip, causing his foe to practically collapse in exhaustion. From there it was just a matter of time. Tobias performed a clothesline, and it was a clean KO. He hadn't even been able to practice his submission holds. Meanwhile, Barry, Flunky and some of the group elders sat together, enjoying fairly excellent cuisine. This was disappointing as practice, with utterly mediocre competition. But Barry could think of worse ways to spend an evening. When they left, it was pouring, and they all went to bed soaking wet. The next morning came as a grey rainy pall that made one feel more asleep than when one was unconscious. Everybody stayed in their rooms. Barry paced. It was late afternoon and no sign of letting up. By dinner time, it had finally stopped. Barry went down. None of the group was visible anywhere. A scant few sad chumps sat at slot machines in the corners. The receptionist wore the stoic serenity of slow business. Barry went out. The street was flooded. The other streets were flooded. Water that went up to the knees in the best places. It wouldn't drain. Oily and brown, with horrid roaches darting about in it, it must have been a nightmare to the rat population. The evening lights were already on. Nebulae of detritus swirled about. Cosmos of trash flowed down the street languidly, like traveling islands from some liquidous dimension. Strangely, there was no odor. Barry walked to a dingy corner store, bought a loaf of bread and cheese. Then he made his soggy way to Marcel's. Marcel nibbled the bread. Tea was plentiful. Barry was more thankful for it than ever. Thunder rumbled gently in the distance. The lighting in Marcel's little place was moody. Marcel looked slightly more refreshed than before who could say why. I like the plan. The rats have told me that it's easy to get into the dome via the sewer. They'll be around for us and I would be down to watch some wrestling. He nibbled a piece of cheese. He enjoyed cheese, of that there was no doubt. But he hardly looked like a rat. More like a fellow who just happened to like his cheese. Without overwhelming enthusiasm for anything. Without commitment. Without remorse. Marcel was without, without, without. What was Marcel with? The two gentlemen sat for some time, in silent contemplation. Barry saw potential in Marcel. But potential was not what was important in this case. It wasn't by itself spiritual. Marcel, thank you for the help. If you want to join us, and you don't mind ending up in T-Town, or wherever else you chose to stop, there's room. You can more than pull your own weight in a group of mainly meatheads. Marcel smiled. 
Thanks. I'll consider it. And it was clearer than ever that, though he had kept his old habits out of habit he was ready for a change of scenery. He looked out of the window. It was dark. The panes shined slightly with the almost red reflection off the oily rainwater. A roach peeked through, scoping out the situation inside. It would doubtless make an attempt for some free food. A fresh pot of water was coming to a boil. Things were looking up. The secret was simple. The sewers were rife with blockages. That much was obvious. Huge piles of furniture, whole carts, all sorts of materials, not to mention bones of all type human very much included had been disposed of down there over the years, accumulating in key areas. The drains appeared to simply be clogged with normal debris. However, over the centuries, the deeper parts of the trash piles had undergone a process of calcification that made many of the city's sewer drains effectively watertight. Even as the streets flooded above, key areas of the sewer never saw more than a trickle. Beneath Crometo Marina was one of the driest regions. The Neozo drainage system was operating at something like 10% capacity relative to when it was first built, and there was nobody in the city to do anything to fix it. This was a city on the edge. The day of the match had brought little fresh rain, and the boys had looked around town, satisfying their tourist desires. Now, Marcel scouted out in front of the T-Town group, which marched in formation, conspicuous as ever. Everyone minded their own business in Neozo. There was certainly a police force, but they hadn't been spotted the whole visit so far, nor had. Any news about the gate incident been circulating among the populace at least not within hearing. A number of harlots of all colorful types, dressed in scant yet theatrical attire with old-fashioned frills clearly aiming at a tourist demographic loitered in front of a dim back ally. Seeing a horde of muscular yokels marching toward them, they put on business demeanor. Excuse me ladies and gents, Marcel said, shuffling between them into the alley. The group soon followed, and the expressions of the harlots let on the peevishness of business promised and rescinded at the last moment, but they didn't waste words of complaint instead turning back to the still soggy street. Marcel pointed to a manhole. This should be it. A boy grabbed it and lifted easily. Then Marcel was down into the depths with cool-headed speed, followed by Barry, Tobias, Flunky, the elders, and the rabble of rest Lebois. It stank well enough. The incarnation of staleness busted out at them. Dark as night, the eyes adjusted with surprising rapidity. A fair-sized contingent of rats scurried in a loose unit in front of Marcel, chittering occasionally, seemingly in conference and deliberation as they moved forward. Marcel nodded in their direction occasionally. This rate-walking ability could be damn useful in the right hands, reflected Barry. Damn useful. The march began. Down the winding corridors they marched. The sounds of the street filtered through, as if from memories. At times, a massive pile of refuse would be visible down a corridor to one side, doubtless keeping back a flood of septic water that would be deadly if let loose. None dared look too closely at those piles. As the group wended towards the city center, the rodents their expert guides, the halls widened. The light became better, from what source none could tell. The spectral noises of the world above reverberated. It was a festive night. From an alley, fresh puke filtered down a wall from some unseen aperture. It wasn't even 8 p.m. The atmosphere was of the debauchery, not of victory and celebration, joie de vivre and clean living, but of a daily defeat and humiliation needing to be forgot, of morbidity and nihilating self-destruction, death by a thousand cuts. And yet there was a festive color to it, that seemed a magic, tragic remainder, from a time long past a time when the city was just as wicked and more, capable of unspeakable acts of true brutality, but before the culture had begun to degenerate, before the devil had come to take his due, a time when clean things were still allowed to exist in the midst of all that chaos. And in the fall, those clean things had been dirted, and had extracted their dirty revenge. All this reverberated through the grates above like 10,000 years calling out on a HAM radio. 
and it dripped. It dripped. They were near to the Chrome Dome Arena sewer access. Everyone could feel it. What evil magic had sloughed down this corridor in the past 10,000 years? How many would-be warriors of legend had passed as carcasses, taken too soon, too soon, on the way to the great delta bayou that connected with the illimitable sea? But now, what little flowed down these corridors, less wet than an average street above in a strong rain, was unlikely to ever make it that far. The corridor inclined slightly upwards. And then there was light. And from nowhere, they saw it. The strange grey figure was nearly as wide as it was tall, but with long, rangy, muscular limbs, not a trace of fat anywhere. It stooped forward slightly under the weight of its own back muscles. Grey limbs ended in dexterous grey hands clutching jagged daggers the size of short swords. Lanky but muscular grey legs bent dexterously at the knees, like a spring coiled for action. And atop a straining grey neck, a massive, pointy-fanged, snarling grey rat face. Not just like a rat it was literally a rat head. The eyes burned baleful crimson, the nostril tip dripped grey slime. It pointed with a dagger. At its feet, a horde of giant rats, with fangs sharp as its own, scampered and cavorted. Get these kooks. I want ya to rip them into streamers. The giant rats lunged forward then abruptly changed course for Marcel. He was pulling out a variety of cheeses. The giant rats joined their smaller brethren and began to nibble, with Marcel looking on benevolently. Rack. Useless kook soy boys. The giant man rot punched a dagger downward at the air in disgust and thwarted ambition. He turned to the group. Already, Barry, Tobias and Flunky had pulled metal baseball bats out from behind their backs. Look, Barry said reasonably to the man rot. If you come at us with those deadly weapons, we're really gonna have to kick your ass. I can't guarantee that you won't end up seriously injured. The man rot lunged. Tobias swung his metal bat downward and struck the big grey left hand with perfect timing, knocking brutally against hard bones and sending the weapon clattering to the wet ground. Flunky swung with speed, hitting the other arm's wrist resoundingly, sending a painful shiver throughout the arm and loosening the grip on the dagger, which flopped out. In the next second, the ratman's momentum brought his face into easy range of Barry. Simultaneously, Barry had been winding up for a downward swing. His back muscles assumed the proper form. He let the bat gather momentum. And there was an electric thrumming in the air, as if all the air in the corridor, as if gravity itself, were briefly pulled around the vortex created by the massive momentum that metal baseball bat picked up in a single second, traveling a few feet. Briefly, the metal bat seemed to glow blue from the energy, and the thrum cancelled out all other sound, bringing everything into its thrumming world of momentum and anticipation, a metaphysical place. Then, just when everyone was looking away, there was a massive sweeter V. Pulling up sharply on his arms at the last minute, Barry gave the man rot a tap on the nose end of his snout with the bat, slamming him jaw first into the nasty shallow sewer water, sending out a wide splish. It was plain that it would have been a lethal blow, if not for the pulling of the punch. The man rot's butt was still in the air as, barely clinging to consciousness, he took his injured hands and propped himself up painfully. Barry looked admiringly on his struggles, and felt a twinge of compassion. But at no instant did he slacken his guard. I don't know what they're paying you. But if I'm any judge, these employers are for chumps. Now, take your rat gang, go off somewhere where it's not worth their while to follow you, and don't ever bother honest citizens. Not that we're honest citizens, or that there are very many around here, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. The man rot nodded. He put his wrecked fingers into his broken mouth and made a forlorn airy noise not totally unlike a whistle. The rats, annoyed to have their cheese tasting interrupted, came begrudgingly. Hey, Marcel called after the group as it was leaving. The man rot turned with a frown. Marcel threw the nice cheeses to him, one at a time. He transferred them to his lieutenants, 
who shared them about dutifully as they scampered. Thanks, the man Rot said with a smile. I won't forget you guys. Then he and his posse were subsumed by the corridor's eternal grey twilight. Nine squirrel nut trippers. Barry and Marcel peeked their heads out of the hatch. It was evident nobody was guarding the sewer room in the arena, with the capable man Rot thought to be down below. They snuck out. The sewer room was small and dark, in a back hall. Light filtered in from not at all far away, and cheering and shouting reverberated. They peeked down the hall and saw wrestlers milling. About. Marcel motioned to the rest to come up. Okay, Barry said to the foremost. We're going to go out there and act natural, because we have nothing to hide. We're here legitimately. Got it? Let's go mingle. The group marched, with exaggerated casualness, out to where the wrestlers were. The glare of the lights was blinding. After the sewer, there was no hiding it everyone in the T-Town group was totally blinded, their eyes burning. Where did you guys come from, a rather small guy in a look at her mask asked. Oh, we just got here late, said Tobias, smiling winningly. We're the T-Town boys. I never heard of that, the Lucadoroid shrugged. As their eyes adjusted, the group saw a massive ring. Inside, two groups of wrestlers a group of five dogface guys in black tights, and a group of five smallish Lucadoroids, were in all-out war. Rabid wrestling fans, most of them ultra-flabby and some almost pure flopping flab stuff, packed the stadium form stem to stern. Above, the chrome dome of chrome dome arena shone metallic. There were many wrestlers in this waiting area to the side. If the T-Town boys could distinguish themselves, the embarrassment their breaking in would cause would simply be too great for stadium security to let on, and they could escape from the arena scot-free with the prize money. If not, they would be booted out in ignominy. It was time to be strategic. Barry glanced at the wrestlers. Absolutely every one of them was looking right at him. He waved. Sorry to barge in, running late. Most continued to stare. All right. He would just examine them while they were examining him. Why not? Then he saw them. A tag team. One was Phil, leader of the Dog Boys. The other was Gaspordu. Who was Gaspordu? How did he know this guy's name? He knew it. But Gaspordu had been changed by. Ah. Been changed. He had an eye patch, and his head and eyebrows were shaved. There was a pallor about him. Barry turned to look at Flunky. Was it just him, or was there something of a resemblance? Who's next? The guy from the booking desk was going around with a blackboard. I've got five guys right here, said Barry pointing to five T-Town boys at random. Good, the booker said. Get on in there with the Gator Tribers. It was plain he didn't recognize them, just as Barry had suspected. Next, it was a chaotic free-for-all of wrestling wars between groups from all around. Groups were thrown into the ring haphazardly. Many were eliminated almost instantly. A number of T-Town boys stuck it out in these crazy groupings for a good while. The three most experienced almost made it to the end. But not quite. The T-Town team needed more polishing, more experience. Barry didn't even attempt to keep track of all the results of these crazy bouts. Tag Team Time Where are my tag teams? Barry and Tobias stepped enthusiastically forward. So did Phil and Gaspordu. Any others? Nobody else came forward. This is a 1,000 cred cash prize. He looked around. Are there really no other tag teams in this tournament? Still no response. All right. I have the dog devastation and... I don't see you on here, T-Town Dynamic Duo, Barry prompted. The booker flipped his prop paper around. Ah. Dog Devastation and T-Town Dynamic Duo. Okay, go. You're in that corner. When they were in their corner of the ring, Barry and Tobias huddled. 
These guys look structurally sound, said Tobias, and they might have good cornering. I agree, said Barry. What do you think of Fulcrum 16? I was about to say the same. They splurted water on themselves from bottles, quickly rubbed each other's backs, stretched their arms up to the sky. Okay, said Tobias. This should be intense. But I'm ready. The ref motioned to the two groups. They stepped into the ring. Immediately, Phil jumped up onto his corner's post. Gasporta flew up, his feet landing on Phil's waiting palms. Then Phil sent Gasporta flying at Barry, seeming to hang in the air like a bloodthirsty bat. Barry dodge rolled. Phil came down, clearly intent on cornering Barry. Barry made an eye motion to Tobias. Then he grabbed the ropes and began scurrying along them at turbo speed, like a giant squirrel. Gasporta lunged, nearly grabbed him. But he got to the corner where Tobias was waiting standing on his head. Barry leapt nimble off the ropes and grabbed Tobias' shins like he was grabbing a weapon. Then he ran out, let Tobias have some slack, ran around a little and got some momentum. Tobias followed like a human flag, and they both stayed just out of reach of the dog devastation. But the circle was closing. Barry would have to put parts 12 through 16 into effect and he'd have to do it now. Coming to a stop, he began to just spin and spin Tobias in a circle around him. Dog devastation was conferring on what they should do. Without losing spinning speed, Barry now slowly started to come towards them. And Gasporta took the bait. He jumped at Tobias, grabbing him. Now Gasporta was stuck in the spin. Phil bounced off the net and charged Barry with breathtaking speed. He would make it between the rotations, which had been slowed slightly by the added weight, and knock Barry down heavily. Barry jumped. He flew into the air like a beautiful swan. A goose of grace. A swan of shine. He ascended towards the heavens like a hairy archangel. His arm was the only thing to mar the grace. Because its veins were popping out with the effort of dragging two strong men through the air one-handed. Tobias hung from his grip like a massive baton, his shin aching fearsomely from the tightness of the hold. And on Tobias, clung Gaspordu, like a giant pale tick. At the apex of the leap, Barry brought his other arm over. And he focused. He focused. And he focused. 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 And he focused. He focused. And he focused. 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 And he focused. Barry brought his arm down. Tobias felt wondrous relief, because no matter how much the impending impact hurt, he knew that his shin would soon be free. He transferred that energy to the task of getting Gaspor to turn so that he hit Phil. He shuffled the off-guard Gaspor to around, until he had a grip on the guy's shin. And now he wielded Gaspordu. And Phil was coming nearer, hardly having processed what was about to happen to him. And Barry looked down, and he knew that once Gaspordu made contact, he would no longer be Gaspordu, that he would just be some dog-face boy. Three hundred years ago. It was the sinful streets of Neozo. The drainage was better, and if anything there were more crows. And the patriarchal ancestor of both Gaspordu and the first dogface was cavorting in the streets with the flabbiest harlot of that era. She would give birth to twins soon. But the existence of Gaspordu was putting the universe out of sorts, and even his ancestor seemed to have hardly existed. The dogface people, on the other hand, definitely existed. They were calling to Barry. Don't disappoint us. And Barry called back. Don't disappoint all of us. Barry called them, and said don't you dare disappoint us. It was a balmy summer night. The venerable ancestor of Gaspordu and all dog-face people waltzed into the flabby harlot's luxurious chambers. 
and they made sensuous love. After the old man planted his seed, he had a fatal heart attack. The flabby mother strumpet took his belongings. She put his clothes in a chest. Impassive, she opened a trapdoor to a chute she had for just this purpose. Down into the sewer went the body. Nobody would remember. The harlot could never explain to herself why she didn't have the old boy wear protection, why she'd happily seen it through to the end as if she was planning on getting pregnant, when nothing could be farther from the truth. But right now she was doing her face up with powder, not even thinking about what had just happened. And at the front entrance to the bordello, the double doors burst open, revealing the stout little red praying mantis man. Hello, anyone in? Uncle Ciziak here. How much money does it take to get some erotic depravity in this joint? The vision ended. Barry was swinging Tobias with both hands. Tobias was swinging Gaspordu with both hands. And Gaspordu was flailing about, not knowing what hit him. And Phil was barreling towards Gaspordu with unstoppable momentum. Then, contact. The two dog devastation smacked face first into one another. The rest of the body followed. Total. Smackage. Tobias tucked and rolled in the nick of time. Barry landed on his feet in a crouching position. And dog devastation, now truly combined on account of being smacked together at a hundred miles an hour like two clay toy men, toppled onto the ground. The crowd made seemingly random noises as they tried to piece together the events of the last half minute. The ref came over and kneeled by the dropped dogs. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. And the winner is Dash. Hold it. It was the booker. Squirrel. Barry turned. A giant squirrel, about the size of Barry but of normal squirrel appearance in all other respects, sat in the opposite corner, baring its buck teeth in a sneer. Go. It hopped up and rushed over with arms outstretched, immediately forcing Barry to come to grips. Its strength was impressive. The foe stood in a deadlock. Suddenly, the squirrel jumped back and ran backwards, bouncing its back against the ropes. It bounced off and rushed forward with arm held to the side, in a close-line attack. It was fast but transparent. Barry Dodge rolled to the side and forward, giving himself more space between the still-running squirrel. Then, he got a running start and lunged feet first through the air. The spectators, still bewildered by what they had seen a moment ago, marveled. Barry was lightweight by wrestling standards. Yet the perfect form of this dropkick gave it a sense of weight greater than the sum of its ounces. It was the Bruce Lee effect, watching a combat maneuver that had been shown by other experts a thousand times before, and would be shown a thousand times hence, but that was thus all the more impressive by the fact that it was impressive. During the outlandish tag team antics, the crowd had hardly been able to process what they were seeing. Barry sailed on wings of gravity. As his feet struck the giant squirrel's back with a resounding thud, everything began to come home. The fans got unsteadily to their feet. The squirrel flew as if hit by a battering ram. Slamming sideways into the ropes, it briefly got tangled there, before flopping out the other side smack onto the floor outside the ring. The noise intensified, the enthusiasm that much greater, because rather than the normal thrill of expressly cheering for a star hero they well knew, the audience was experiencing the prized novelty of something they didn't know. Barry glanced over. The ref was just outside the ring, arguing with the booker. He lip-read the booker saying something about last ditch. The ref turned away impatiently, addressed the audience. The Grey Rat who. In the other corner, the man rot from the sewer stood with a bandage, evidently made yellow and ragged to give it a more edgy appearance, on his nose. Both his hands and wrists were bandaged and gloved in a way that made it appear to the ignorant like some kind of fashion decision. Barry couldn't believe that they would send someone out in this condition. Tobias was sitting with the T-Town team, 
waiting patiently for the stars of dizziness to stop dancing in front of his eyes. Immediately on seeing Barry, the man Ra turned to the rep forfeit. What? I forfeit the match. Man Rot was matter of fact. How was this tournament set up? Evidently there had been great plans for that giant squirrel, and the management was not enthused about giving away prize money to unknowns. The booker was cursing the man Rot. You're through. The man Rot held up his hand palm first. Fine. He had figured out a perfect way to get out of there. Barry smiled. The T-Town boys were sprinting back down the sewer tunnels with their thousand creds. That was the worst organized event I've ever seen, said Tobias. It's a challenge to set up good events. As soon as I saw that booker, I knew he wasn't up to it. Chaos is great, when it's organized chaos that keeps the audience guessing. But there has to be an underlying architecture. Yeah, but you also need good performers, said Marcel. I mean I'm not big on wrestling, but those dog devastation guys were the only other good wrestlers. That squirrel was just a gimmick. We haven't even begun to wrestle, said Barry. Our boys should have distinguished themselves more. We need more practice. Wrestling, reflected Marcel, is a lot of sweaty dudes. It's a big sausage fest. And you see a lot of gimmicks and tournaments that are organized in ways that make no sense. Wrestling is kinda weird. But maybe I'm okay with that. Is there still a place in the group? After the former leader's death, there's a spot for you in the head carriage. We leave through the western gate tomorrow dash. It truly came out of nowhere. A large-breasted female giant squirrel, twice the size of Barry. It grabbed him. And it flung him to the side, over a giant pile of trash, with more strength than he'd ever felt. It tossed him like a bale of hay. He was glad, in that instant, that he wasn't carrying any of the creds. They would have been lost to the group. He sailed over the pile which had the aura of doom about it, dropped, was caught up in the putrid current. Where had the great squirrel come from? Was it the mother of the squirrel he had bested? It's plus size. Lover. A roving squirrel unconnected with the other? What was up with those big honkin' squirrel bazongas? He'd never seen anything like it. Floating helplessly on his back, he grabbed a chunk of calcified trash for buoyancy. Soon he lost his sense of direction, spiraling hither and yon, through untold corridors of nether night. One hundred years after the first dog face was conceived, now the tribe of dog faces had spread throughout the southwestern United States. They lived in dirty apartment buildings in dusty little towns, selling and consuming peyote buds and marijuana leaves. These were the dogs. Their world was made loco through inebriation. And their first leader was a dog-faced woman of ultra-sagaciousness. A woman named Morgo. The dogs wrestled. They fought. They did the cool drugs. And they gathered power, always underground, always gathering, growing in strength. Because dogs hate the establishment. They hate conformity. Dogs know what they hate. But what do dogs love? They loved alchemy. But at that time, none of them were very good at it. But Morgo had a power of precognition. It was part of what had made her their leader. Cezik knocked on the door of the Grand Royal Apartment. Morgo answered do you got the weed brownies to give me as an offering? Cezik nodded. And I got more than that. Let's watch some daytime television. I think you'll find my plans, delicious. Finks everywhere. As Barry floated through the night, visions aswarm his brain, it was all starting to add up. This plot was about much more than wrestling. It was about the spiritual destiny of a people. Of many people. He shivered in the damp night. And he kept floating.